Uh, I've been asked to say a couple of words on the topic of the uh, corporate assault on uh, public education, uh, which is very real. I'm sure you've all experienced it. Uh, it's real and it's important to keep in mind what we all know, uh, that it's not taking place in isolation. It's just one part of a corporate assault on the population generally. And it's also, I don't have to tell you, it's not new. It goes on all the time. Uh, we can go back to 1776 when uh, Adam Smith uh, warned that the, uh, he put it, the masters of mankind uh, relentlessly pursue their vile maxim, uh, all for ourselves, nothing for anyone else. Uh, and they use their control of the political system, as he also pointed out, to uh, assist this pursuit. In his words, he's talking about England, of course. He said the principal architects of policy in England are the people who essentially own the country. The, in his day, the merchants and manufacturers. And they make use of uh, uh, their wealth and influence to ensure that uh, their own interests are very scrupulously served and no matter how grievous the effect on the people of England, or of course on their much uh, worse uh, victims abroad, the victims of what he called the savage injustice of the Europeans, and he was particularly concerned with uh, uh, India, the place where England was uh, carrying out its uh, savage brutality at the time. Well. That's a voice from 1776, and uh, if it sounds familiar, it uh, should. It's resounded over and over again since then. A uh, century later, after Adam Smith, uh, so early, mid-19th century, the, those are the early days of the Industrial Revolution in the United States, mostly around eastern Massachusetts. Uh, and uh, the, uh, it was uh, a working people condemned uh, vigorously the new phase of the assault on the population by the masters of mankind following their vile maxim. Uh, they were at the time being driven into the industrial system uh, which they uh, condemned because uh, for many reasons one thing they claimed argued rightly is it was depriving them of their basic rights as free men and women. And uh, in Women's History Month, it's worth remembering that women were in the forefront of this. Uh, the women driven into the mills were uh, young women from the farms called uh, factory girls at the time. Uh, they had a lively press. This is the period of the freest press in the history of the United States. Uh, ethnic press, uh, uh, labor press, uh, uh, very lively, vigorous, and it's worth, it's worth reading what they said. Uh, the contributions to the freest press in our history by uh, factory girls, uh, artisans from Boston, others who were being driven into the mills. And it's also well to remember that at that time, a working class culture, and that means high culture, was alive and flourishing. Uh, there's a great book about the 19th century a British working class and what they were reading. Jonathan Rose, The Intellectual Life of the British Working Class. It's a monumental study of their reading habits and uh, he contrasts, I'll quote him, the passionate pursuit of knowledge by proletarian autodidacts with the pervasive Philistinism of the British aristocracy. And pretty much the same was true here. So around eastern Massachusetts, uh, an Irish uh, blacksmith in Boston, let's say, if he could afford it, would hire a young boy to uh, read classics to him while he was working. The factory girls from the farms were uh, reading what we call classics, the best contemporary literature of the day and the, uh, the actual classics. Uh, uh, this went on for a long time.
I mean, I'm old enough to remember the 1930s, not too far from here, in fact, where a lot of my family lived, mostly uh, unemployed working class, uh, but they uh, uh, had a, uh, many of them didn't even go, hadn't even gone to school, you know, fourth grade maybe, uh, but they were part of the high culture of the day, uh, you know, discussing uh, uh, the latest Shakespeare plays on free plays in Central Park, the Budapest String Quartet, the uh, different varieties of psychoanalysis, every political movement you can think of. Uh, there were also, uh, there was also quite lively workers' education. And some of the outstanding uh, scientists and mathematicians of the day were directly involved in workers' education. In books like uh, Mathematics for the Millions by uh, Lancet Hogman, great introduction to mathematics, uh, J.D. Bernal and others. A lot of them came out of the Communist Party. As I say, I can, I'm old enough to remember it. Well, a lot of this has been lost under the relentless assault of the masters, but it's not, it can be recovered. It's uh, not lost forever, and it's important. Well, the labor press of the early Industrial Revolutions, 150 years ago, uh, they took strong positions on lots of things, positions which should have a resonance today. So they took for granted that, as they put it, uh, those who work in the mills should own them. Uh, they condemned wage labor, uh, which they argued was not very different from slavery. It was different from slavery only in that it was supposedly temporary. I mean, that was such a popular view in the uh, 1860s, that period, that it was actually uh, the program of the Republican Party. Uh, that was, uh, you could read editorials about it in the New York Times. Uh, wage labor is just a form of slavery, and it uh, should be overcome. Uh, one prime target of their condemnation was what they called the new spirit of the age, gain wealth, forgetting all but self. Uh, that's 150 years ago. And huge efforts have been made ever since then, they're going on right now, to drive this new spirit of the age into people's heads. Uh, we're subjected to it constantly. And there's a reason. Uh, in order to sustain the rule of the masters, it's necessary to pacify the public, uh, necessary to make people think uh, that's the way it has to be that uh, your suffering and your deprivation uh, seems right to you. That's the new spirit of the age. If what we're supposed to do is gain wealth, forgetting all but self, then if you're not wealthy, it's your fault. And uh, nothing systematic about it. You gotta, that has to be driven into your heads and it continues to the present. And there are huge industries devoted to it. I mean, about a sixth of the economy, one out of every six dollars, is devoted to uh, what's called marketing, uh, which is mostly propaganda. It's uh, designed to, uh, as analysts put it, it's designed to fabricate wants, uh, to drive people to the superficial things of life, like fashionable consumption. Uh, the uh, Lead, the public relations industry, huge industry, is, is quite explicitly devoted to this task. Uh, it's uh, one of its leading figures, one of its founders, uh, Edward Bernays, uh, said that the goal of the industry, writing in the 1920s, is uh, what he called engineering consent, uh, to make sure that the intelligent minority, he's a member of it, of course, uh, the intelligent minority can rule without being bothered, having their lives disrupted by uh, the masses who uh, are better, should be marginalized and taught that, uh, to obey and to be passive. And uh, nothing is left untouched. About uh, 20 years ago, the advertising industry realized that uh, there's a segment of the population that they're not reaching because they don't have any money, so they can't buy, namely children. Uh, but then they figured a way around this. Uh, what you can do is uh, propagandize children so that they'll nag their parents to buy things. And if any of you watch 
television I watch with my grandchildren or little children, it starts at two years old. And in fact, there's a, uh, there is even a field of academic psychology in the colleges called nagging, where you teach how to get kids to nag in different ways for different things. And that way you can trap children into the, uh, uh, the uh, pursuit of uh, uh, superficial things of life, like fashionable consumption, uh, and uh, to be passive and obedient. Uh, well, that's, uh, uh, this of course includes the schools. In fact, mass education was understood the same way uh, right at the beginning. Actually, mass public education is one of the great achievements of the United States. It was well in the lead in developing a mass public education system, college too. So the U.S. did pioneer it, uh, but uh, it had purposes. Uh, one purpose was to drive independent farmers into the industrial system uh, to induce them to give up their independence, the rights of free men and women, and to submit themselves to industrial discipline and everything that went along with it, uh, to accept the life of uh, uh, wage slavery, which is the way they described it, but to accept it as the right thing to do. And that didn't pass without notice. So Ralph Waldo Emerson uh, uh, discussed uh, what he, uh, uh, he discussed the fact that uh, the political leaders of his day, he noticed, were calling for popular education. And uh, when he thought about why they were doing it, he said their reason is fear. They say that this country is filling up with thousands and millions of voters, and you must educate them to keep them from our throats. In other words, educate them the right way to passivity, obedience, acceptance of their fate as right and just, uh, conforming to the new spirit of the age. They keep their perspectives narrow, their understanding limited, uh, discourage uh, free independent thought, uh, frighten them into obedience because the masters are afraid. You gotta keep them from our throats. And that's of course the task for the school, schools as well. Well, this new spirit of the age uh, from 150 years ago, which is a common theme uh, right in front of our eyes. It's inhuman and it's savage and it meets resistance. And there are victories, uh, some of them significant ones. So one set of major victories was in fact in the 1930s uh, when there was popular uprising, a uh, significant one. On the cutting edge of it were things like uh, uh, organization of the CIO, uh, which uh, reach the level of uh, sit-down strikes. And sit-down strikes are terrifying for the masters of mankind because they recognize that a sit-down strike is just one step before uh, going on with the uh, slogan, the idea that those who work in the mills should own them and run them. Why do we need the masters? We're sitting here, instead of sitting here, let's take it over and run it. That's frightening. At that point, you began getting significant New Deal legislation, which was real, a lot of progress, uh, led to uh, uh, what's often called the golden age of state capitalism, 50s and the 60s, uh, when there was the highest growth rate in American history, uh, pretty egalitarian growth rate. Growth rate. Uh, for the African-American population, it was actually the first time that they had a, test, a, a taste, at least, of what it's like to become part of the mainstream of American life. As I don't have to tell you, after the Civil War, when theoretically slaves were freed, uh, there were a couple of years of formal freedom, uh, but by 1877, uh, there was a North-South Compact, which re effectively reintroduced slavery, uh, criminalized through cr criminalization of black life. Uh, so if a black man is standing on the street, he can be arrested for vagrancy. If he's looking, what somebody claims, he's looking the wrong, wrong way at a white woman, he can be arrested for attempted rape. Uh, you put it to jail with corrupt judges, you never get out. You become part of a slave labor force. 
in fact, a good bit, part of the uh, American Industrial Revolution is based on that, uh, mining, uh, steel mills, and so on. And that lasted until the Second World War. Uh, Second World War, there was a need for free labor. So, yes, it changed, and there were a couple of decades, uh, say, when a black man could get a job in an auto plant and, you know, make a little money, buy a house, uh, send his kids to college, and so on. Uh, by the 1970s, that ended, and we're now going back to the criminalization of black life, starting in the early 70s, reconstituting what happened in the post-reconstruction age. Uh, uh, major technique for that's the drug war. Uh, but it's very, very striking. Anyway, there was a golden age, a couple of decades, quite significant. Uh, then, uh, uh, but systems of power uh, don't walk away. Uh, this, again, this went on through the 60s. Um, the activism of the 60s had a big impact on the country. It uh, civilized it in many ways, uh, both the 60s and their aftermath. Uh, and uh, systems of power never walk away politely and say, thank you. Uh, they prepare a new assault. And in fact, that's been happening since the early 1970s. The latest phase of the assault on the population began right about then, uh, partly through major changes in the uh, economic system uh, throughout the whole of American history. Uh, this had been a growing, developing, industrializing society, and not in very pretty ways, I need not tell you, but it was, going, and of course with regression, but generally that's what was happening. Uh, that changed in the 1970s. Since then, it's been a, from the point of view of producing things that people need, it's be becoming a stagnant or deindustrializing society. It's a huge change. Uh, the uh, uh, economy shifted from production for needs to financialization. A huge explosion of uh, speculative capital flows. And long production didn't cease, it was just began to be offshore. Uh, to Mexico, China, Vietnam, uh, anywhere, any place where you can get uh, horrendous uh, working conditions, uh, no environmental constraints, uh, huge profit for the masters. Uh, it had happened before, but it took, went into a completely new, new level starting in the 70s. Uh, within the United States, uh, that set off a, kind of a vicious cycle. It led pretty quickly to greater concentration of wealth, the more or less egalitarian growth of the 50s and the 60s changed. Uh, concentration of wealth leads reflexively to concentration of political power. Uh, Adam Smith's maxim again about the masters of mankind and their, how they're architects of policy. Uh, the concentration of wealth increasingly in the financial sector. The concentration of political power, of course, translates right away into legislation, uh, which carries the process forward. Uh, fiscal policies like uh, cutting taxes for the wealthy, uh, deregulation, uh, which uh, permits the financial institutions to do the kinds of things you know about, subprime mortgages and so on, leads right away to regular financial crises through the 50s and the 60s when New Deal legislation was in place, uh, there were no financial crises. Starting in the early 70s, they began, uh, each one worse than the next. Uh, they, uh, they're a problem for the population. They're no problem for the masters because they can rely on the nanny state that they nurture to bail them out. That means the taxpayer to bail them out. It happens time after time. It sets off uh, a doom loop. That's what it's called by the official of the Bank of England uh, who's responsible for financial stability. Uh, the leading uh, financial correspondent in the English-speaking world, the most respected one, uh, Martin Wolf of the uh, Financial Times, no radical <laughs> incidentally. Now he describes the financial institutions as an out of control financial sector that's eating out the modern market economy from inside, just as the larva of a spider wasp eats out the host in which it's been laid. And it continues, and it's getting worse. 
uh, as this vicious cycle continues, uh, it, it does leave a superfluous population, namely the producing the workforce. Uh, there's a close race class correlation in the United States, so you've got to do something with the superfluous population. And uh, you, what's going on is pretty much what happened in 1877. Uh, criminalize them, uh, send them to jail, and turn them to factory work. So they're a labor force again. In fact, the uh, American prisons are even, you might have seen in the papers either yesterday or today that some private industries are complaining because they're being undercut by a state-run prison industry. The prisons have a nice, docile workforce. You don't get strikes. You, know, you don't get people asking for benefits. Uh, you can control that in ways that I don't have to mention. Uh, they even uh, produce a, a clothing so that there's, a, uh, there's a, a kind of genes called prison blues that are produced in prisons. They're not allowed to be sold in the United States, but they sell them in places like China. Uh, so that's an effective way to deal with the uh, uh, deindustrialization of the country. Well, for the large majority, uh, it's a rich country, so it's, this life is kind of stagnating for them. Wages and incomes have pretty much stagnated for approximately 30, 35 years. Uh, but people get by somehow. Uh, they get by by much heavier workloads. Uh, in the United States by now, uh, the working people work you know, maybe a month or six weeks more a year than in Europe, even higher than in Japan. Uh, 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 borrowing, you know, so increasing debt, which of course can't go on forever, and uh, kind of trying to live off the, uh, uh, the bubbles, the financial bubbles that come along. So like the housing bubble gives you paper money, but they crash and wealth goes with it. Again, for the, for the African-American population, the last one has been a total disaster. Uh, net wealth is down to almost zero, barely detectable. Uh, so that's the vast majority. Uh, of course, it bursts, and the perpetrators are uh, bailed out by the taxpayers. That's the doom loop. Uh, in parallel, uh, you get exactly what Adam Smith described. The political system is more and more in the hands of those who concentrate wealth. And in fact, the political system has been shredded in the past roughly generation, 30, 35 years, in order to approach Adam Smith's maxim uh, even more closely than it did before. Uh, cost of elections has skyrocketed. That means both parties are driven deeper into the pockets of uh, the corporate pockets where the money is. Uh, the Republicans by now, it's kind of the level of farce. Uh, the Democrats, who are what used to be called <coughs> moderate Republicans, aren't that far behind. And it's not just elections, it's also uh, Congress. It used to be the case that in Congress, a position of influence, say chair of a committee, was gained by uh, service, uh, seniority, or, you know, wasn't perfect, but at least that was the idea. That's no longer the case. You have to buy, buy the position by putting money into the party coffers, which of course drives Congress even deeper than before into the pockets of those who have the money. Uh, some of the uh, current effects were reviewed recently by the Inspector General, government government's official who was the inspector general of the uh, Bush-Obama uh, bailout programs, uh, Neil Borofsky his name is, he pointed out that the, there was legislation that authorized the bailout, uh, but he pointed out it was a bargain, it was two-sided. Uh, the financial institutions that were responsible for the catastrophe, they would be saved by the taxpayer as usual and the victims of their misdeeds would be very partially compensated by measures to protect home values and uh, secure home ownership. Well, to the surprise of no one who, familiar with the workings of the political system, only the first part of the bargain was kept. The financial institutions were rewarded lavishly for having tanked the economy, 
Uh, the TARP bailouts, which people talk about, are the least of it. They're a small fraction of the total bailout. Uh, meanwhile, the rest of the program just floundered. So I'll quote Borofsky, uh, foreclosures continue to mount with uh, 8 to 13 million filings forecast, while the biggest banks are 20% larger than they were before the crisis, and they control a larger part of our economy than ever. They reasonably assume that the government will rescue them again. Uh, the next crisis, which is now being, the basis is now being laid. And he goes on to say that the credit agencies incorporate future government bailouts into their assessments of the largest banks. So when they you know, assess the, how reliable a bank is, they take into account the fact that if anything goes wrong, you will bail it out. Uh, that exaggerates uh, market distortions, which are already very severe, and it provides them with an unfair advantage over smaller institutions, enables them to gain more and more power. So in short, he says, uh, Obama's programs were a giveaway to Wall Street executives and a blow in the solar plexus to the defenseless victims, and very likely a stepping stone towards the next and probably worse financial crisis as uh, business lobbying, which is extraordinary, uh, chips away at the Dodd-Frank uh, regulation bill. Well, the latest phase in the class war, the one that took off since the 70s, uh, that was reviewed in an interesting recent study by the Economics, Economic Policy Institute. That's the major source of reliable data on uh, these developments year by year. Uh, the title of their review is called Failure by Design. And the term design is quite accurate. Uh, other choices have been possible all along the road. They still are. They also point out that the failure is class-based. So to adopt the imagery of the Occupy movement, it's a failure for the 99%, uh, for the 1%, to be more accurate, one-tenth of one percent. It's a spectacular success, and by design, which is just what you'd expect when policy is designed by concentrations of power, not economic power, nothing new. Trace it back to 1776. Well, and it's not just the United States. Uh, the masters of mankind are an international class. If you go, turn to Europe, what's happening is very striking. Uh, there's what's called a troika, the European Central Bank, the European Union International Monetary Fund, and they're imposing austerity in a time of recession. Well, it's, it's not a very obscure what's going to happen when you impose austerity in a period of recession. It's Herbert Hoover. Uh, the IMF just came out with a big study in which they reviewed about 170 cases where such policies were pursued, and they're all the same. It leads to uh, further uh, decline in economic growth, uh, further suffering, and so on. No, no escape from the, in fact, makes the debt worse. And that's exactly what current experience has been in England, in Greece, and so on. Uh, some economists uh, economists have been kind of critical of this, and some of them describe it as a stupidity or a madness even. But I think there's a much simpler explanation. Failure by design. Actually, there was just a recent interview in the Wall Street Journal with the president of the European Central Bank, Mario Draghi. And he says very cheerfully, Europe's social contract is obsolete. We can get rid of the hated welfare state. Uh, we can weaken labor, uh, we can entrench the rule of the masters and their vile maxim, and we can devote major efforts to uh, instill in the public mind the new spirit of the age. There's no alternative, Margaret Thatcher's famous slogan. This is how it has to be, so they'll accept what's happening to them. There's nothing irrational about that at all. Uh, it's classic, understandable, perfectly rational. Uh, we, of course, have our own variant. Uh, there's always a gap between public opinion and public policy. 
But by now that gap has expanded to a chasm. So uh, within the Beltway, you know, Washington discussion, and uh, hence in the media, uh, the major issue is the deficit. Got to do something about the deficit. Uh, meanwhile, there, this is a very heavily polled society. We know what people think. And for the public, the main problem is jobs, not the deficit. Uh, and the public is right. That's a much greater problem. The deficit is, you know, maybe it's a problem in the long run, but uh, right now, certainly the markets don't think it's a problem. Uh, the U.S. borrowing is practically zero interest rate uh, because they don't, uh, finance, financial institutions don't care about the deficit like the public. Uh, when you turn to the deficit, of course, policy is what the financial institutions want, the deficit, not jobs. Uh, actually, the term jobs is used, so uh, standard rhetoric is, uh, it's like the Republicans uh, uh, ideologues never say uh, we want to reward uh, the rich. And what they say is we want to reward the job producers, uh, meaning the rich. Uh, the term jobs just means profits. You're not allowed to pronounce the word profits if you, you know, P-R-O-F-I-T-S, kind of like an obscene word. If you notice, it's almost never used. Uh, what's used is creating jobs, meaning creating profits. Uh, the, uh, uh, if we turn to uh, the deficit, whatever ranking you give it among the set of problems, the public also has opinions about the, the deficit, which doesn't regard as a serious problem. Uh, you should overcome the deficit by taxing the rich. I mean, at least to the level of the beginning of the latest onslaught. Uh, during the golden age, they were taxed far more heavily and it was great for the economy. Uh, so at least tax the rich and preserve the benefits, uh, social security, uh, the medical benefits. Policy is the opposite. Uh, there's, there's a range, so at the extreme end you get uh, the Paul Ryan Republican catechism that everyone has to sign into. Uh, Obama has a kind of a milder version, uh, but if you look, it's similar. Uh, with regard to the medical uh, system, the expenses are real. Uh, when the press says the growth of medical expenses would ultimately be very serious blow to the economy, they're right. But it's not Medicare, it's the private insurance system, which is hopelessly dysfunctional. The US healthcare system, which is mostly privatized and unregulated and off the international spectrum in this respect, is about twice as high per capita as comparable countries and doesn't have particularly good outcomes and uh, leaves 50 million people uninsured. That's estimated roughly 50 million extra deaths a year. Uh, the, uh, uh, so as long as the Medi Medicare has to go through the uh, privatized health system, sure, it'll be inefficient and expensive. Even though Medicare itself is much more efficient, say much lower administrative costs than the privatized system. Uh, in fact, if we had a health system like other industrial countries, not exactly a utopian dream, uh, there wouldn't be a deficit at all. In fact, there would be a surplus. Well, it's been worked out well by economist Dean Baker. Uh, but that's not discussed. Can't discuss that. Financial institutions are too powerful, so that's off the agenda. Uh, what about Social Security? It's an interesting case. It's not a fiscal problem. Uh, Social Security's in quite good shape. A little tweaking more or less go on forever. But it is a big ideological problem. Uh, that's why there's a constant attack on Social Security. Uh, and there's a reason, I think. Social Security violates the new spirit of the age. Uh, Social Security is based on the assumption that you care about other people. You care whether there's, uh, you know, it's like I personally, I get Social Security, but I got a big pension, so I don't need it. Uh, on the other hand, so therefore, under the new spirit of the age, I'm not supposed to care if a disabled widow across town is starving, right? So, to, to, in order to instill the new spirit, you've got to get rid of things like this. It teaches all the wrong notions. Solidarity, mutual support, care for one another, all kind of 
terrible ideas that have to be driven out of people's heads. And uh, uh, I think the assault on public education is driven in part by pretty much the same forces. When you think about public education, it's the same. So like I don't have kids in school. So under the new spirit, why should I pay taxes for schools? You know, what do, why should I care if the kid across the street has a school? If you really uh, trapped into the new spirit uh, of the last 150 years, you shouldn't. And public education kind of teaches those values. Again, caring for each other, uh, caring whether uh, other children have opportunities. We're not supposed to think that. That's what you've got to drive out of people's heads. Well, coming to the assault on education, it has many different aspects. So, with, start with the colleges and the universities. Uh, it took off in the 1970s. Uh, the activism of the 60s, as I mentioned, uh, had a major civilizing effect on the society in all kinds of ways. Uh, and it aroused deep concern right across the mainstream spectrum. That's why it's, the 60s are conventionally called the time of troubles. And it was troubles for the 1%. It uh, civilized the country. That's dangerous. And the reaction was immediate, uh, from right to what's called left, right across the spectrum. So at, I'll just keep to the universities for the moment. Uh, at the right, uh, the most uh, uh, striking illustration of it was a very influential uh, memorandum uh, which was uh, written by Lewis pa Powell. He's a corporate lawyer, later appointed the Supreme Court by uh, Richard Nixon. It was secret, but it leaked. You can find it on the internet. It's worth looking at. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, what's called the left, there was an important study uh, by the uh, Trilateral Commission these are liberal internationalists from the three major state capitalist industrial systems of the United States, Europe, Japan. Uh, the general outlook of the group is given by the fact that they almost entirely staffed the Carter administration. That's where they come from. Uh, so that's the spectrum. And both of them merit attention. They provide a good insight into the ideological aspects of the assault on democracy and rights, on schooling, that was beginning to take shape about 40 years ago, escalated sharply in the Reagan-Thatcher years, uh, picked up by Clinton-Bush, uh, now reaching new heights. And they also provide insight into why the assault targets the educational system. So let's start with Powell. This memo was 1971. It was sent to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, you know, the main business lobby intended to be secret. Uh, the title was The Attack on the American Free Enterprise System. And it's worth reading not only for the contents, which are interesting, but for the paranoid tone, which is quite characteristic of business li literature. Now, if, you have a, if you're the masters, you have a kind of totalitarian attitude, then if anything gets out of control, the world's coming to an end. You know? So the rhetoric tends to be kind of inflated and paranoid. Uh, and that's true of the Powell Memorandum. He targeted uh, particular criminals. The major ones were Ralph Nader uh, with his consumer <laughs> safety campaigns, uh, Herbert Marcuse, who was preaching Marxism, to the masses, if anybody ever heard of them. Uh, new leftists who were on the rampage all over, and of course their naive victims who we said uh, dominate uh, the universities, the schools, control TV and other media, uh, control the educated community, and virtually control the government. If you think I'm exaggerating, I urge that you read it. I'm not. Uh, their takeover of the country, he said, is a dire threat to freedom because the only alternatives to free enterprise are various kinds of bureaucratic regulation of individual freedom, ranging from moderate socialism to the iron heel of the leftists or rightist dictatorships. It's essentially the rhetoric of today's Republican debates, where the center-right administration of Obama is 
regularly called, you know, Marxist revolutionary or something like that. <laughs> and that's what it looks like if you're one of the masters, because it does slightly chip away at total domination. Well, actually, Powell himself was very familiar with another alternative to free enterprise, and namely the system in which he and his Chamber of Commerce associates thrived. Remember, he was a, lo he was a, uh, a lobbyist for the tobacco industry. Uh, he was surely aware of the huge federal subsidies for the production of this leading killer, which not only kills users uh, at a scale vastly beyond the mislabeled drug wars, uh, which have a lot more to do with control than they do with drugs, but they also kill plenty of other people. Uh, so they what are called passive smokers. It's called collateral damage and contemporary euphemism. And Powell was also surely aware of the great success of lobbyists like him in uh, assuring that for many decades uh, the government helped the industry conceal what they all knew about the lethal product they were peddling, the huge mounds of corpses to show for their achievement, uh, still piling up rapidly. But that didn't keep him from wailing in the memo that, as every business executive knows, few elements of American society today have as little influence in government as the American businessman, the corporation, or even the millions of corporate stockholders. To translate that into English, it means we don't have 100% control. So therefore, we have nothing. Uh, typical totalitarian attitude often finds extreme form in the business literature and things like this. Well, he, he drew the uh, obvious conclusion from this. The campuses from which much of the criticism emanates are supported by tax funds generated largely from American business, contributions from capital funds controlled or generated by American business, the boards of trustees of our universities overwhelmingly are composed of men and women who are leaders in the business system. And most of the media, including the national TV systems, are owned and theoretically controlled by corporations which depend on profits and the enterprise system on which they survive. Therefore, we uh, beaten down businessmen who have no power anymore uh, we should organize to defend ourselves instead of just watching passively while business and our fundamental freedoms are uh, destroyed by the Marxist uh, onslaught from the media, the universities, and government. Well, that's uh, the expression of the sense, the concerns uh, elicited by 60s activism at the right end of the mainstream spectrum. And as more revealing still, I think, is the reaction at the opposite extreme, uh, the kind that you get from the liberal internationalists, uh, Carter-type liberals. Now, that's spelled out in the, in the Trilateral Commission report that I mentioned, which is called the Crisis of Democracy. And they say there was a real crisis. The cri and I'm pretty frank about it. Again, I urge you to read it if you haven't done it. Now, the crisis is there was too much democracy. Uh, the system worked fine, they said, when most of the population was silent, passive, apathetic, obedient. Uh, but in the 1960s, something happened. The special interests began to try to enter the political arena to press for their demands. So who were the special interests? Uh, women, minorities, uh, young people, old people, uh, farmers, uh, working people, in other words, the population. Uh, and they're not supposed to press their demands. Uh, they're supposed to be sitting quietly and obedient while the in intelligent minority uh, run things in everyone's interest. Uh, there was one group omitted in their lament, uh, the corporate sector. And uh, that's because they're not a special interest. Uh, they express what's called the national interest. Uh, so therefore, we can't touch them. Uh, uh, and uh, like the far right, the 
liberal scholars just take it for granted that uh, the extraordinary power of the uh, corporate institutions is and their con control of the state and other institutions, that's just the natural order. So there's no point mentioning it. You don't mention the fact that we breathe air. And a primary concern of the trilateral scholars was the failures of what they called the institutions responsible for the indoctrination of the young. Their term, not mine. That's the schools, the universities, the churches. Uh, they're not indoctrinating the young properly. Now, that's why we have uh, uh, these uprisings in the streets and, and the efforts of the special interests to press their demands in the political arena. So in general, they said, we have to have more moderation in democracy if it's to be preserved and the national interest is to be protected. And crucially, we must have more successful indoctrination of the young. Well, at that point, the current phase of the assault on the public education system takes, takes off. Uh, and these concerns expressed at both ends of the ideological spectrum, they have led to vigorous action to restore order and indoctrination. Uh, one consequence is the assault on public education, which takes many forms. I'll just give a couple illustrations. Uh, about a year ago, I happened to be giving talks in Mexico at the National University, uh, UNAM. Very good university. It's hard to get in, but uh, it's free. Uh, uh, there was an attempt to raise tuition about 10 years ago. It led to a national student strike, which practically closed the country down, and the government backed off. In fact, one of the administration buildings on the campus is still occupied. It's kind of a community center. Uh, so no tuition. It doesn't have the wealth and you know, salaries of an American university, but it's quite a high-class university. A very high standards, good work, uh, and so on. Uh, but free. Uh, in the city, in Mexico City, there was a leftist mayor, uh, Lopez Obrador. He established the university in the city, uh, which is not only free, but open admissions. Uh, so anybody can go. If people aren't ready, they get compensatory training. I talked there too. It's, pretty, it's quite impressive. Also high standards, good achievements, good faculty, dedicated faculty. So that's Mexico, poor country. Uh, it happened that from Mexico, I went on to California, to the Bay Area, to Berkeley. Uh, that's the richest place in the world outside of maybe, you know, Qatar. Uh, they're destroying the greatest public education system in the world, like systematically destroying it, failure by design. Now, the public education system in California, which is really you know, the jewel of the system, and in fact, better than anything in the world, it's changing. It's now being, the major universities are being pretty much privatized for the rich. They're becoming like Ivy League colleges. And for the rest of the system, it's being uh, slowly modified to technical training uh, for the rest. And that's happening across the country. By now, in most states, uh, tuition covers more than half of the costs for the state colleges. That pretty soon only the community colleges will be publicly financed under current tendencies, and even they are under attack. So analysts agree, I'm quoting, that the era of affordable four-year public universities, heavily subsidized by the state, may be over. And there are similar developments in the private universities where the costs are just out of sight. Uh, that's a very important way to implement the indoctrination of the young. Students come out of college in a debt trap. They don't have many options. And the debt trap is now approaching a trillion dollars beyond credit card debt. And it's an exceptionally punishing kind of debt. Like if, you know, if you, most debt, uh, you can get out of in unpleasant ways. You can escape through bankruptcy. Can't do that here. There's no expiration date on the debt. Uh, collectors can garnish your wages for the rest of your life. 
uh, Social Security, uh, uh, unemployment benefits, forever. You're trapped. Uh, for the students, that's a very effective trap for life. It does sharply cut down options, and particularly when employment opportunities are weak. Actually, the basic idea was explained by one of the trustees of the New York State University system. He's been, he said, there's been a shift from the belief that we as a nation benefit from higher education to a belief that it's the people who are receiving the education who primarily benefit, so they should foot the bill. And that's the new spirit of the age again. Actually, that belief is not among the population. It's among the principal architects of policy, and it's always been their belief. Uh, but now they feel in a position to implement it under the rising assault. Well, as usual, the main victims are the most vulnerable. In this respect, it's quite similar to subprime lending, which went after the poorest, uh, most vulnerable. Uh, and there's an educational analog to that. It's called for-profit colleges, which are mostly scams. Uh, they seem to offer opportunities. But when you take a closer look, uh, say, just take debt figures, it turns out that about 96% of the people, they're mostly poorer people, uh, about 96% are in debt, uh, and within 15 years, it's about 40% default. So they're not only trapped, they're robbed. Uh, and the kind of education they get isn't much either. Uh, well, the Mexico-California comparison illustrates a crucial point. Uh, the reasons for the conscious destruction of the greatest public education system in the world, uh, the reasons are not economic. Uh, Mexico is a poor country. We're a rich country. And there are many other cases, including rich societies, like, say, Germany or uh, Finland, which ranks highest in educational achievement in the world, it's free. Uh, actually, post-war U.S. experience is another example. In the post-Second World period, period, there was a program, the GI Bill, which enabled a huge number of people who would never have been able to go to college uh, to go to college at public expense. And it was very rewarding for them, and it was also extremely beneficial to the country. In fact, that's a large part of the reason for the golden age, economic golden age. Uh, so once again, like austerity under recession, the policy of closing this off makes absolutely no economic sense, but it is a good technique of class warfare. Not economic, uh, but uh, not necessary, but a technique of indoctrination and control, and in that regard, it's quite val valuable. Well, in parallel to all of this, there's a process of corporatization of the universities going on. Uh, there's a huge increase over the past 30 years, 35 years, huge increase in uh, highly paid administrative co um, staff. Uh, payment is way beyond the level of anything except maybe football coaches. Uh, increasingly, they're professional administrators. In earlier days, administration, which wasn't much of a big deal, was just carried out by faculty on temporary leave or something. Now it's professional administrators, very high paid, uh, carrying with them the corporate culture. There's a very good study of the process by a well-known sociologist, Benjamin Ginsburg. It's called The Fall of the Faculty, The Rise of the All-Administrative University and Why It Matters. And one effect is to introduce the corporate culture into the universities. That has many manifestations. Uh, one of them is a drive for what's called efficiency, which is an interesting concept. It's not an economic concept, though it's called that. It's really an ideological concept. And, you know, uh, we all know it. Now, so suppose you call a, a bank or an airline or any other institution, you know, uh, complain that something was wrong or to get some information or whatever it may be. Uh, you know what happens. Uh, you call them up, uh, you get a recorded message. Uh, the recorded message tells you, we love your business, we love you, hang on. And you hang on while this message is repeated every couple of minutes and you listen to some music. And you know, finally, at the end of it all, you get some kind of a menu. 
uh, which is totally incomprehensible and doesn't have the options you want. And finally, if you wait long enough, you may get a human being. I'm sure you've all been through this. Well, for the business, this increases efficiency. Their costs are lower. And for ideological reasons, that's all that's counted. Uh, for the users, it's very costly. I mean, you're wasting your time, that's money, you know, you're uh, wasting your energy, all that's costly. But that's not counted. And those costs are multiplied across the population, which means they can be quite huge. But it's called efficiency. And it's the same when you go to the universities. So in the universities, efficiency means you reduce the proportion of faculty to students. You have uh, faculty replaced by uh, cheap labor, temps, you know, just like in business. Uh, easily replaceable temporary labor, uh, graduate students, uh, adjuncts, uh, easily exploitable. You don't pay them much and they, you know, they can't ask for their rights. They're going to be out anyway. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's good for the bottom line, for the professional business administrators who are running the colleges. There's also a harm, namely to the students, uh, but you don't count that. That's part of the ideological character of estimating costs. Uh, another process is uh, eliminate programs that are too expensive. Now, you may have seen an interesting discussion of this in the New York Times a couple of days ago. Now, they pointed out that state colleges around the country are eliminating programs in engineering, computer science, and nursing, which happen to be exactly the fields where, where there are job opportunities, where labor is needed. Uh, but uh, they're expensive. Uh, so by good corporate logic, you eliminate the programs that the society needs and the people need because they can get jobs, but they cost too much, so eliminate them. And uh, bottom line looks better. It's good corporate logic. Well, you go down to K to 12, and it's more or less similar. Uh, the main technique to, uh, main part of the assault is just defunding. Uh, if you want to privatize something and destroy it, the standard method is first defund it so it doesn't work. Then people get upset about it. Then they accept privatization. So, for example, when Margaret Thatcher wanted to destroy the uh, railroad system in England, she first defunded it. Uh, didn't work. You know, people have to wait too long. It doesn't you know? They get, the trains get stuck. Finally, they said, let's privatize it. They privatize it. It turns into a total disaster. Now, they had to renationalize it to get it to function at a mo much lower level. Now, that's familiar. And that's what's happening with the schools. Uh, they're defunded, so they don't work. So people say, okay, let's have a private school or a charter school or anything just to get us out of this mess, uh, which, of course, not as an economic necessity or any other kind. Uh, also, just plain dumbing down the schools. I mean, there, there are you know, there's, there's debates that go back to the Enlightenment about what education ought to be. Uh, during the Enlightenment, the, uh, there was kind of evocative imagery which uh, contrasted different approaches to education. Uh, one Im image is education as being like a vessel into which you pour water. And as you all know, it's a pretty leaky vessel. Uh, every one of us who's been to school uh, has gone through this and you know, you memorize something for an exam and it all leaks out the next day. You weren't interested in it. You didn't pay any attention. A week later, you can't remember what the subject was. So that's one image. The other image that was used was that teaching ought to be like laying out a string along which the student can progress in his or her own way, uh, discovering uh, rather than just memorizing. So there's some structure, you know, like that there's topics that you want to cover, but design them in a way so that uh, the process of uh, uh, going through, uh, of, of gaining the uh, understanding and information is one of a creative individual activity in cooperation with others often. Well, that's the enlightenment idea. Uh, the pouring water ideal has a name now. It's called No Child Left Behind or race to the top, uh, which is exactly what it is. 
it kills interest, it, uh, it deadens the students, but it makes them more passive and obedient and not too much trouble, at least that's the idea. Uh, the, uh, and, and it can be done, I just don't want to spend too much time on it, but they're very good models where it's achieved. I'll give you one model that just happened to be discussed in uh, the, uh, the, the journal Science, the main journal of the American uh, Association for Advancement of Science. I just had a series of editorials by its editor on the destruction of science education in the country uh, through uh, no child left behind type measures uh, from kindergarten to university. So get the kids to memorize something that they don't understand and don't care about, like uh, the periodic table or you know the enzymes that uh, metabolize something and kind of memorize it and write it down and go on to the next thing. Uh, no joy of discovery, no, in, no invention, you no know, conception of why anybody should do this ridiculous boring thing. Uh, but it does, uh, you know, you get past the exam and uh, if the teacher's salaries, let's say, our survival is dependent on this, they don't have any choices either, uh, not many at least. Well, that's one way to do it. And uh, the same series of articles does suggest alternatives. Uh, it was not necessary to suggest alternatives at the university level because they're actually done. So at a place like MIT, for example, uh, uh, student, uh, uh, lectures aren't intended to be poured into a vessel. In fact, the standard doctrine is it doesn't matter what you cover in the course, it matters what you discover. And you discover it in your own way and you learn how to discover. The sciences couldn't survive if, if that wasn't pursued, at least at elite institutions, so it is. Uh, but you can do it down to the kindergarten level. And in fact, uh, the editor, Bruce Alberts, discusses a, a kindergarten program, which he suggests is a model, is for five-year-old kids. Uh, it's a program where the kids in a class where each kid was given a, a small dish, uh, which had in it uh, pebbles, uh, shells, and seeds. And they were supposed to figure out which ones are the seeds. And so the first thing they did was have a scientific conference, as they called it. Kids got together, thought of various ways in which you could test to see which were the seeds, and they tried some of them, they didn't work. They tried others, they worked better. Uh, they exchanged ideas, and improved them. Finally, they got to the point where they had figured out what the seeds were. And the next step was to give them all magnifying glasses uh, and crack the seeds so they could look inside and find the uh, embryo, which was the source of the energy that makes the seed grow. Okay, those kids learned something, not only about seeds, but about discovery, about how to go on to the next task and why it's fun to do so and important to do so. Now, that can be done. Any of you who have been teachers know way more than I can say about this. Well, it could be done at any level, but it has a defect. It empowers the teachers instead of humiliating them, which is very important, uh, and it enriches the lives of students and uh, prepares them for creative, uh, independent lives, not passive obedience. Well, all of this is more failure by design. And again, the word design is quite crucial. Now, there are alternatives, there are successful models uh, in our own history, uh, elsewhere. We should be able to progress well beyond those, those models, but only by dedicated struggle, and not passive acquiescence uh, while all of this goes on before our eyes.